Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Thank you so much for joining in today. This conversation today is going to feature a husband and wife, Dr. Elsbeth Moit and Freddie Zentel Weaver, who are going to talk about sexual enlightenment, how to create lasting fulfillment in life, love, and intimacy. This is the Dare to Dream podcast. It's been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award and has been voted by Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to. The show is sponsored by Dr. Dane Here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. You can find them at their websites, drdanehere, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. I teach entrepreneurs, speakers, healers, and uh, coaches how to write a highly engaging book. I coach people on writing a book privately as well as through our group ongoing twice a month. I also take authors' books to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the work for the author. And finally, I show the same folks the other piece of visibility, which is how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. If you would like to get some information and a leg up about how you can start writing your book, becoming a bestseller and being interviewed, go to debbie-singer.com slash gift. And there I give away templates and a lot of how-tos so you can start doing this right away. It's debbie-singer.com slash gift, D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift. So today's episode features a conversation on lasting intimacy and fulfillment in relationships. My guests are Dr. Elizabeth Moit and Freddie Zentel Weaver. They both assisted thousands of couples and singles to create lasting intimacy and fulfillment in their life and relationships. They're featured on Showtime's documentary series, Sexual Healing, and the Emmy Award winning NBC show, Starting Over. They're best-selling authors of Sexual Enlightenment, endorsed by world-renowned spiritual pioneer, Dr. Michael Beckwith, and the co-founders of Tantra Nova Institute in Chicago. They got nominated as Changemaker at the Housewife sponsored 2016 United State of Women Summit in Washington, DC. Elsbeth and Freddie are beloveds, husband and wife, as well as business partners residing in Chicago. You can learn more at their website, go to tantranova.com. And with that, I welcome Elsbeth and Freddie to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you both here. Welcome. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, Debbie, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So let's start off, Elsbeth and Freddie. Tell us about the work you do. Tell us about the people whom you work with. Wow. Okay. You want to start? Well, yeah. So we have had our institute here in Chicago for the last 21 years. Mm -hmm. And Elsbeth and I met on the internet, and we can talk about that later. But the work that we do, we've done all over the world with couples and singles and individuals. And we teach practices of how to use sexual energy to get more deeply connected to what we most deeply desire in our life and how to stay connected with yourself and your partner and life in general. So we'll get into unpacking that yes. today. And yeah. the work is deeply influenced, of course, by uh, the practice of Tantra, which is an ancient tradition that comes from East India. Uh, and Tantra is the yoga of the energetic body. We in the West, we are very familiar with, you know, uh, familiar with yoga centers at every corner, street corner. Uh, however, the focus there is that it's the yoga of the physical body. So how would it be to learn more about the energies that flow through me at all times? Otherwise, I wouldn't be alive. And so these energy shows, uh, energies show up in different ways, in the physical, sexual, in the emotional and love. 
and then in the mental and consciousness or spiritual uh, way. And so the tantric practice allows us to not only tap into these different dimensions and bring more awareness to it, but also to become more integrated. So we can fully live the sexual, spiritual human being that we are, you know? So. I'm curious when you talk about this, and thank you for the explanation. It's very clear. How nervous are people when they come to work with you? What are they thinking when they show up or what are their biggest fears? Oh. Yeah, actually, they usually when they come to us, they often have either read our book or like on a show like this one, they have heard us speak and share. And usually when they come, something was spoken to within themselves, mm -hmm. like something they are looking for and then found a coherence in hearing us and learning what this is all about, particularly, you know, when we take it out of the just tantric sex notion. This is just one dimension. Yeah, we get a lot of couples and singles who want to either be in a relationship or more deeply connect with the relationship they're already in. And when they read and see and hear and learn more about what we're offering, what they're listening for and what they're resonating with is something that is a deep desire with most of us. We all want to connect, feel connected, be heard, be loved, and so on. And so that is what we call remembering what we've forgotten. Uh, so they just naturally just come to us. And the sexual piece is just a unique way of getting to what it is we don't see. And we'll get into that more in terms of, yeah. 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 I want to give you a chance to respond and don't want to just go too deep too fast. I know you got a great listening audience and I want to really be clear with what we want to share with you today. Oh, that's so kind. I, I love that line, what it is we don't see. So I, I want to take you up on that. Can we... Can we find out what does that mean? Yes, exactly. yes good. Yeah, so uh, particular, particularly in the realm of intimacy and love in our sexual self, there is so much obscured, so much in the unconscious or subconscious. And our society, and I'm really talking about our world society because that is not unique to one particular culture or, or people. Um, is that the sexual, we call it the last frontier, which hasn't been explored consciously, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's either uh, suppressed, or we are obsessed, or I mean, the whole porn craze, and, you know, like, like, and sex trade, and I mean, it has been there for millennia, it's not a new thing. Mm -hmm. While we may have become more aware over the last 50 years around our emotional self, because through therapy and transformational, you know, offerings and approaches, we now can speak about our emotions and are allowed to feel our emotions and express them. That was not necessarily so in the 1950s. Um, then through yoga and meditation, we have become more aware and reflective and contemplative. And, and the last of the third, like, you know, mind, uh, emotion, heart, and body, the sexual, the last one is really that what hasn't been consciously approached. And so, yes, to your question from a little earlier, you know, sometimes it takes a person several years before they show up. They heard about us five years ago, and then they come after several years and said, you know, I was very curious then, but I just couldn't bring myself to coming here because, you know, they were not ready. And I want to say, Debbie, to further um, illustrate this, not, you know, not seeing what's what we're doing to create what we're getting. So we live often from the past into the now into the future. So if I was in a bad relationship or I was beaten by my father, I might flinch today un, you know, uncontroll, uncontrollably if somebody raised their hand at me, I might have a real problem with that or uh, not want to be in a relationship, but I was hurt so badly before I can't do it, right? So something I don't see about what's creating 
what I'm getting. And it's not even that obvious for a lot of folks. It's like, I would like to be in a relationship with a woman, but I just can't find the right woman or the right guy. And they're all over the place. It's like you don't see red cars until you have one. Mm -hmm. So the unveiling of what we don't see happens in a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways to get actionable insights, you know, talking, talk therapy or walking meditations uh, and, and so on. But very few ways I know of, actually none, that teach how to work with the life force or sexual energy as a way to get more deeply connected and unmask ourselves, our unconscious selves, because the sexual energy, whether you're doing consciousness work or not, when you're in it, you're more open, loving, vulnerable, receptive, chemically we're changed, more oxytocin, endorphins, serotonin, the feel-good hormones, so we're in an altered state emotionally and chemically. So what we teach our distinctions on how you can work with that altered state to get more deeply connected with what you have set out as an intention, mm -hmm. and that's where the sexual energetic becomes a way to be more connected or to transform yeah. what we can't seem to see how to do. Let me give you a very concrete example, you know, and I'm going to use myself because it was, this is why I'm teaching Tantra today. This is why I'm here with Freddy Sintal sharing, you know, this art of sexual spiritual connection with you and your audience is that over 20 years ago, I, I was a management consultant at that time, and I was really good. It was in the 90s, really good at consulting, yet miserable in relationship. I had this pattern of attracting unavailable men. And while that was exciting at times, most of the time I was alone. And I vividly remember that there came a moment when I fell so deeply into despair, because I could see that if I was not going to change the trajectory, that I would, you know, leave this planet without ever having had lasting intimacy and love in my life. Now, I did have love and intimacy in my life, but I was not able to sustain it. And I was at a point where I said, okay, I'm going to do anything, whatever. And so I deeply delved into uh, meditation and then went on to studying Tantra, you know, as a discipline, as a practice, not just reading a book here and there. And what opened up for me out of this practice, this Tantric healing, was that I got to see that I distrusted men. Now, if you had known me, Debbie, 23, 24 years ago, you know, you never would have called me a distrusting bitch. I was very, you know, charming. I reeled them in. So it was underneath in the subconscious that there was something. And through the tantric practice, through the tantric healing, and there's a very distinct ritual for the woman to tap into her most inner sensual sexual self where we can discover and uncover what may live there on the cellular level uh, in our sexual center actually and in that moment when i was touched in a certain place a vivid memory came up it was when i was 18 years old first boyfriend, first love. We just had spent a couple of very blissful years. And then he asked me to have intercourse. And I said, yes, although I was not ready. And it was freakingly painful mm. to go to the gynecologist. The bill went to my house. My dad opened it. All hell broke loose. He called me a whore. The boyfriend left shortly after. So there I was totally alone, no soul to turn to. And that was the time when I started closing off, you know, like armoring. So my whole torso, my sexual being, my emotional being, although I became very promiscuous, but it was more like to get some validation, <clears throat> not really opening my heart because that was too painful. So anyway, I did some uh, therapy in my 30s around that, and that was very helpful. So I thought it was all complete. Yet little did I know that 
that what was living or remembered on the cellular level was not accessible through the conscious mind. So we cannot talk about it. We cannot access it. So anyway, yeah. that was cleared and in place of the distrust, deeper trust in myself opened up, more trust in men in general. And the six months later, Freddie Zental came into my life. And so this is Voila. a great, great, yeah, great example of what we're talking about. This unmasking that happens in this sexual vul intimate vulnerability and chemically changed and emotionally changed state that we're in in the sexual. Now there's some pieces that people learn in the workshops that allow them to work in this ritual in this way because for the guy if he's giving to his beloved or his woman and he's doing a sexual ritual it might for him be overwhelming that hey we should be doing mutual love making now you know i'm excited you're excited let's get at it so what's what's learned in the ritual is how to hold space how to uh be in particular um uh roles people are given roles there's a giver and there's a receiver and this is, does not take the place of mutual lovemaking and all the other wonderful things we do with sexual energy. This is a new way of approaching sexual energy and the, the altered shifts that happen uh, as a, an approach to getting to what we don't see. Because hmm. that stuff is hidden. It's deeply hidden. And so we're shifting things, not intellectually or linguistically, but energetically. I and understand. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I deeply, deeply understand this modality of healing so so important because i think a lot of men and women are traumatized um and don't realize it for various reasons mm. so when you talk about that i love these rituals you're mentioning what exactly is the power of slow sex what are the benefits and what is the power of doing sex or rituals slowly yeah. So, well, we're talking about two different things, actually, in, in our in our uh, parlance. So the ritual is a specific way of being a giver and being a receiver in roles in mutual lovemaking and slow sex. You can integrate aspects of what you do in the ritual in terms of gazing, breathing together, mm -hmm. mutual enjoyment, uh, transmuting and uh, trans, uh, you know, circulating orgasmic energy or nectar and all of those things you can do in a lovemaking, mutual lovemaking. Uh, it's a little different, again, when you are uh, in the roles of uh, uh, specific ritual practices. We teach it in terms of modality to get to something intentionally that you want to see that you otherwise can't get close to emotionally. That's a little different because when you're in a mutual lovemaking stance, you're both adults. You're both giving and receiving, and you both play roles of that. Yeah, let's talk about this a little bit more, the giving and receiving, that imagine to be in the receiver role for an hour, for two hours, what could be possible to be experienced there and listened for that is not available in the mutual back and forth? Mm. You know, now- Can you give some examples? What is possible there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in that instance, and I'll let you take it right back, is, you know, if you are receiving and say my, my intention is to let go of the anger I have towards my mother for beating me all the time, right? And it's shown up in my relationships. This is as just a hypothetical. And so now I'm being given to by my beloved. And I'm in this intimate state of sexual intimacy where perhaps I'm aroused or I'm not. And I've alterly, altered with the endorphins and serotonin, the feel-good hormones. I'm emotionally more avail available. And I have this intention to let go of this anger towards my mother, for instance. I might then get in touch with a deep sadness in this intimate vulnerability. This is not a place that I would go to if I was mutually lovemaking with someone. And that, that door opened because of this intimate vulnerability in, in terms of this altered state, as an example. So then I can get in touch with that, let it go, recognize it, and be a little further down the road of getting unloosed, if you will, from that uh, emotional attachment, yeah. unconscious emotional attachment. And the rituals, allowing ourselves to drop into this receivership, which of course requires a lot of trust. And that is such a huge thing for all of us because letting go, mm. surrendering, and we never surrender to another, we actually surrender to ourselves. And the other gets to share in that with us. Because the fear often with surrendering is like, oh, then I give myself up. No, we don't give ourselves up. 
surrendering is letting go, letting go into myself, into my bliss, and to share this with another can be most blissful, you know? Is, there a, is it possible to surrender? I mean, I know when I orgasm, 100%, I couldn't tell you what I'm doing or being in that moment. I'm just so in an experience, right? And so I know that level. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like when my partner, I've seen him in complete surrender. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of a new thing in our relationship, which is really oh. beautiful yes, and a yes. gift. Is there a way outside of orgasm to be in that full surrender? Yeah, you can, it, you know, orgasm is not just a moment. Like being in the orgasmic wave or the orgasmic dance which like, you know, then it becomes very effortless. And this is not only available for the woman because the woman has, you know, is circular in terms of sexual energy. Energy flows like this and all over the place. And like masculine energy is linear, directional, you know, forward coming. Uh, it's based in testosterone that is, you know, driven strong and, uh, but in the end, through the tantric practice, a man can actually learn to also have multiple orgasms or be in the orgasmic wave. And that's one of the practices that men learn. So we have uh, women's workshops and men's workshops and co-ed workshops. And specifically in the men's workshop, one of the main practices is for them to learn as a homework practice, how to separate ejaculation from orgasm. And that's a couple of things. One, a lot of guys, you know, well, you know, I'm not a quick comer. I can, uh, you know, last as long as I want. She can have all her pleasure and I can come when I get ready. That's not what I'm talking about lasting. I'm talking about a new dimension of consciously circulating this orgasmic nectar. So that means you can ride on this orgasmic wave for an hour or 45 minutes or 30 minutes or however long you want. And you don't always have to end in an ejaculation. There's ways with muscle, breath awareness, and energetic awareness that you can practice learning how to get to 10 being that ejaculatory moment, eight, eight and a half, nine, nine and three quarters, and even a 10, where you can actually have an energetic ejaculation. And you won't spill semen, there won't be the ejaculatory reflex, and you won't have refractory where you lose the erection. And you will still be able to stay engaged because once we as men have the orgasm, it's pretty much over right. until we can regenerate. So if you can uh, transmute uh, or, and circulate that energy, then you can be complete for a moment, but still be able to engage and have energy for other things because it's not just sexual energy. You can use that same energy for other creative pursuits, uh, energetic pursuits the next day and so on. Um, you know, the thing about it, Debbie, too, is like the sexual energy is creative. It creates life. It's pleasurable when we're in it. And when you bring consciousness to the sexual, creativity and pleasure start showing up in areas of your life that seem completely unrelated to sex in the simple process of living. And as opposed to like, well, you know, I hate my job, 30 more years of retirement. That dog actually doesn't hunt anymore because now we're listening what happens energetically when I have this thought and what happens to the total felt sense of my neurosystem, my, my, my circulatory system, my, all of the whole body. Because the thoughts are as powerful as anything we'll ever have. So once we start getting what we call this witness and distance from all of that, then we can start choosing how we're experiencing our life a little more. That's a lot said. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm tracking completely. Okay, good. Um, I have so many questions. So let me, let me lead with this and write this other one down. Uh, so let's just say, based on what you're saying, people these days, as you know, they're so busy, right? So how do they learn to incorporate and dedicate time to lying together, to being together? How can they shift out of that busyness and make this really conscious choice about beingness and sensitivity together? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. It has a lot to do with intentionality. That is where it starts. And intentionality about our relationship or if someone wants to be in a relationship and you know the intentionality is the key thing mm -hmm. it only will show up if you bring awareness to it and energy to it which means that i need to be clear where do i want to bring my energy to in life you know 
usually there are you know three senior uh, priorities work family and relationship you know some people may have something else and then with intentionality to make sure that all three of them are equal mm. if one is more important then you get the results in the other that you don't hold as important so that means intentionality of that this is my relationship with freddie is just as important as tantranova mm. it's not more important it doesn't have to be less important you know then the intentionality shows up every moment throughout the day it may be through a phone call or a text or very particular practices we have that take one or two minutes like for example the heart to heart connection yep. we can just show yeah so yes. i can come to elspeth when she's busy at her desk or vice versa and i come, we come to the front which is the fourth chakra the heart chakra and the same position in the back mirroring the back can you and see it? We're creating like a mudra where I'm holding in the mm -hmm. front and the back. And then we gaze into each other's left eye. And then we breathe in together and we exhale together. And we might do that for 20 seconds or so. But just the stopping and being present for a moment is reminds yeah. us of the gratefulness yeah. and, and the joy of just not having to be so busy in our head. Yeah. The breathing is essential. So we do synchronized breath. We breathe in together and we breathe out together. And on the inhalation, I receive Freddie's love from his heart. And on the exhalation, I send, you know, send my energy, love, love energy, my love into his heart. So we have the circuit and we very intentionally look into each other's left eye because that is correlated uh, to the right brain hemisphere. And it immediately brings us into this experiential, easy place. We, do, we drop out of our head. It happens. It's not like, oh, I have to stop thinking. No, it won't work. Well, what you head. can do, Debbie, and one of the things we teach are how to direct our energy. So the mind is busy. It's going to wander and you're going to be there going like, you know, well, I'm waiting to feel something. I don't feel anything. <laughs> so you use your mind. You put your attention, attention on the breath and your intention to move it on the exhalation and receive it on the inhalation. Now you're using your mind's focus to tune into a subtlety of energy that is there. Yeah, and this happens like this, look at me again. So we're just connecting perhaps three breaths. It's not a long time, but when we do it, we are fully there. Now, this is an agreement we make beforehand because there may be moments when I sit at the computer, I'm so engrossed in some project. And when Freddie comes, it would feel like, could feel like an imposition at that particular moment. But given that I agree to, because that is where my intentionality is in terms of my relationship, that I take a moment and this moment recalibrates not only me, but also this connection is established right away. Mm -hmm. And we can do this at any moment. And of course, what we say is that intimacy doesn't start in the bedroom. Yeah. It is every moment or in the kitchen or, you know. So when you ask how do couples find the time, it's what's the cost if you don't? And it's pretty severe. I will tell, and I will tell you, first of all, you guys are so beautiful. Like yeah. you're so physically beautiful. Oh, and then to see you do that exercise together, I felt that here. That was so moving yeah. to feel you connect like that so quickly to drop in together. Yeah. Cause you know that place. You know, we all as humans know that place and we look like it's over there, but it's always available to us. And so these are the tools for us to all to tap into it regularly because we can really forget that it's there, you know, with all the busy and all of the external reference stuff that we are. And forgive me for asking this very ignorant question. When you do the couples workshops, do people, do they get assignments and then they go back and do them and there's more sharing? Or here's the question du jour that I know a lot of people ask is, do I have to get naked in front of other people? So let's get it out and answer yeah. that. 
Good question. Yeah, so let's clarify that. There's no nudity in any of our workshops. And we the, designed it like that intentionally. The intimacy practices uh, that we teach are then done as homework. Mm -hmm. And in class, in the workshop or the retreat, we do demonstrate them. However, we have props, you know, that we can use to, to be very explicit in terms of instructions so people can really move into a new space with great guidelines. Um, and when we demonstrate it, there is such an energy, just what you described from watching us here, just, you know, imagine showing this in that, let's say the ritual for the woman where I receive and Freddie then gives to me, you know, where I'm really so attuned with myself and he's listening and I can ask for whatever I want or, you know, um, that it becomes very visceral without being naked, you know, and then people go off and do it. If it's a men's workshop, they do their solo practice as homework practice. They just work with themselves. In the women, uh, women's workshop, Awaken to Your Feminine Essence, you know, the women go in on Saturday afternoon and do their self-love practice. We call it self-love practice versus masturbation, which is very different, energetically speaking and er experientially. And then in the couples or uh, co-ed workshops, uh, you know, people go to the hotel room or if they are here from the area of Chicago, then they go home. Uh, if actually when uh, singles come, they pair up with a practice partner and that practice partnership is not about falling in love with each other or having sex together. No, it's to do the learning and to support each other in, you know, each other's learning. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned the women. What does it take? for a woman to let go into receiving and trusting, plus connect with her feminine essence? What mm. needs to occur for there to be the letting go, the receiving, the trusting, and the feminine essence? Yes. So, you know, long before we actually go to sexual intimate practices, practices. work a lot on emotional intimacy. And it starts over here. If I'm not intimately connected with myself, can listen to myself, tune with myself on all levels, sexual, emotional, mental, spiritual levels, I cannot do this with another. So in the women's workshop, I guide women to connect with these different dimensions through practices, uh, you know, through processes. There's a very particular process for the women to drop into their subconscious because that what they struggle with, be it emotionally or be it sexually or relationally, is really lives in the subconscious. If it lived in the conscious mind, they already would have resolved it, you know, by themselves. So when they drop into that subconscious place of themselves, they can discover, you know, where certain notions, certain feelings, certain apprehensions may come from. And we do that process not now to dig in the past. No, we use it so that we have a reference in the past. So for example, with me, with that 18 year old, you know, that hadn't come up in my present day sexual relationship with men. But that is where my distrust was, you know, fueled by. And by tapping into that, then I have a choice if I want to perhaps perpetuate that pain, emotional pain and physical pain I experienced then that's still running underneath like an undercurrent or let that go so that I could drop into myself, come home to myself and trust myself. And so trusting is not an act that we do, you know, like, okay, I want to trust now. It's not how it works. It's really tapping into that often, that place that is so vulnerable, perhaps that got hurt and that we cover up 
So when we cover up something, we cannot be alive in that place. We cannot be expressed, fully expressed in that place. Let me... So let just one moment. And then to your question about the trusting is that in the process, when that what holds us back fizzles out, our, I call it the original self shows up because when we come into this world, we don't, it's not a question of trusting or not. We are just alive, we move, move, look at infants. They are not constricted anyway in their body, in um, their emotional self. But then we grow up and we start compartmentalizing so we can cope with the world, with the punishment, with the fears, all of that. And that is what, in some sense, we want to undo so that that authentic original self can arise in that place, it's actually very easy to trust them, but it's a process, you know, and it doesn't go through the head. Okay. And Freddie, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I wanted to say, you know, Debbie, once you have an actionable insight, like something that, you know, well, before you get to the actionable insights, you come in with an intention and you have an idea of what you want to create, you know, whether it's the girlfriend or a better relationship with your beloved, whatever it is. And once you can get an idea of what that feels like, just dispel any disbelief of that it's not happening or that it can't happen, but just allow yourself to drop into the imagination of it happening. Then we can begin to work with the subtle energy that is the resistance that keeps us from allowing that to be so. And it's in this working with the sexual energy and the shifts that happen, how we become in an altered state with intention and beginning to be in this witness state where we're watching the total felt sense of all these stories and beliefs to then begin to move and step slowly towards what we most deeply desire, getting out of our own way, seeing what we didn't see before that kept us from allowing in what we most deeply desire. And that's how it all comes together as a gestalt to shift with working consciously with sexual energy. And that's, and we've seen it with people who are big meditators who don't know anything about it, uh, all levels of economic and educational agendas, uh, races, all over the world we've done this work. And we get 99% results for people. That's so, really yeah. good. Yeah. That's really I mean, good. How I'm, long I'm, is the workshop? So most of them are three days. The mastery program is more, it's a three month program, so over time. But so we start with a, what we call the foundations workshops. There's one for men, there's one for women, and then there's a co-ed foundations workshop. And they are three days long, like a long weekend, mm -hmm. non-residential, but so really, and it's like an in, intensive for three days, you get totally immersed. Sounds amazing. This yeah, sounds really amazing. Really, it's like recalibrating. And um, it's in the greatest city. <laughs> it's in Chicago. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And we have a beautiful institute. Uh, it's a, a place where when people enter our studio, they say, oh, it feels so safe here, which is, of course, essential in order to trust, you know. Um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, so they start out, we start out with cultivating emotional intimacy. Now that doesn't mean that in these foundational workshops that the sexual doesn't show up, but we don't go in terms of practices in on the first, on the entry level. Um, because again, in order to cultivate trust, trust towards myself and then trust towards another or others, it's essential that we go slow and that we allow ourselves to stop feeling through the heart. And once we are more connected in the heart, then opening to our sexual self, because we really want an integration of the heart in the sex. For men, it's more like connecting the sex with the heart. So they learn how to you know, transmute and breathe up their wonderful energy into their heart. For most women, it's opening their heart so that their sexual center or yoni, as it's called in uh, Sanskrit, which means sacred space, mm. so that their sacred space can open. Yeah. If people have different rhythms, uh, one likes to have intimacy way more than their beloved, how does that play out? Are there techniques to help people be ostensibly on the same page? 
Well, you know, there, there are a variety of, you know, variations that people can work out as, as opposed to resisting. One can look at, well, what is my need to want to have sex so much? And the other could look at what is my need to not want to have sex so much? And then between all of it, there can be a way for uh, them to come together. Now, the thing of it is, is a lot of women, even though they may love their guy and uh, he's like, she, but we have many couples come to us in the peak of their sexual energetic, like in their thirties or early forties, even, or even sometimes twenties. And she's like, you know, I don't know if he loves me. And he's like, of course I love you, baby. Look at me with the erection, you know? And she's like, yeah, but can you kiss me with your heart? Mm-hmm. And that's not something that most guys learn. I mean, we're okay with two uh, emotions, fucking or fighting. Those are the two that are okay for guys, but hugging and intimacy and coddling, that's something for guys in the guy world. It's like not, you know, you're not, you're going to get taken. You're going to get hurt, you know, keep your cards close to your vest. And so what happens in the men's workshop is one of the actionable insights they get are the uh, emotional exercises we do. And they begin to see that there can be a broadening of this emotional uh, experience for them as men. And that connects them with themselves and also then with their counterpart in a deeper way. And then learning to separate the ejaculation from orgasm gives them some consciousness around what seems to be automatistic and uncontrollable. Yeah. So the differences in desire and drive is really just what Freddie alluded to. It's like for the men to become more aware of himself. But it could be the other way around. It yeah, could be, could be. The other you know, because um, I've experienced that. So it could be where the yeah. female yeah. is much more desirous of more intimacy than the male has whatever hormonally or intentionally. Yeah. So it's then really, um, because then again, back to the giving and the receiving, the giving is like, if the desire is higher, you know, the giving is easier because there is this, you know, it's a higher testosterone and that can show up in women as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And the one who may have a lower drive, you know, is that calls more for reawakening. So how can we play again in this giving and receiving that uh, the one who is more desirous you know, it's also aware of that and can transmute the desire through the breath so that it's not so intense yet can be channeled and then be an invitation to the other instead of being felt like it's a demand. And that has something to do with both how we manage our energy and how we listen to each other. And then also that it's an invitation. If both are committed to the relationship, then if there are differences in like, if they question their commitment, it's difficult, you know, to bridge that difference in desire, because that can only be bridged if we are deeply committed to our highest good individually and together, you know? And then of course, if I have less desire than Freddie, then I welcome his invitation. And then I'm also, you know, I allow myself to be invited. And I also, you know, of course, I'm open to take my time or ask him to go slow or to Make touch requests. me. Yeah, touch me. Mr. Usually there's something behind the, the opposition one way or the other. There's something that's not being seen about being together, but then fighting about this very intimate thing, you know, and for guys, sometimes if a woman is really too much intimacy for guys can be scary if they haven't really honed their capacity to hold all that intimacy. Mm -hmm. And and for you guys, I mean, you're a longtime couple in both life and in work, which is amazing. You come Mm -hmm. from dramatically different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. How today do those differences play out in your relationship, personally and career-wise? And how do you manage those and negotiate them? Yeah. So the well, beauty is know. that over the years, oh, I know very well. <laughs> over the years, really, that has been a growing and learning together to actually for both of us, as I see it, and please correct me if you see it differently, is that both of us owns their gifts fully so the whole competitive thing 
or you know fighting for airtime you know all of that that has pretty lessened because freddie contributes in his way and i contribute in my way so that is how like when we teach or when we speak with you you know that we come from different places and they complement each other yeah. so and then in terms of our sexual energy, you know, there have been different phases in our relationship. There used to be times when Freddie was much more desirous than I was when I, you know, post-menopausal. And, and that, on the other hand, that was really good because we both had to look at who we are as sexual beings and what is right for me, what is right for him you know, and from that place create our relationship instead of thinking, oh, there's something wrong. It should be different, mm -hmm. you know. And now, you know, there are also times when I'm more the desirous, more, uh, have more desires, you know, but we just move with it then. Uh, it's, it's really a co-creation instead of having expectations for some result or outcome or performance or that, this depends in the way we relate sexually together, that this has something to do with how much he loves me or how much attention I get. They are no longer correlated. Yeah, we've been together for 21 years, which is the longest relationship I've ever been in. I think before this one, it was five years, you know, and I'll be 60, I was just 66 years old, so. Uh, but the thing of it is, Debbie, uh, we almost to the six months to the day we met, we transcended what I call the romantic drama, mm. you know, uh, and we created this baby, Tantra Nova. And Tantra Nova yeah. has been something that feeds us physically and feeds us emotionally, mm. collectively and individually. Wow. And it's the greatest gift for me that I could be doing in my life in this world. I mean, before this, I was in corporate America and it was just a job. I was in the software business. It was glamorous and in San Francisco and had a Mercedes and all that stuff was all in place. But it was like there was after 15 years, it was something missing. Mm -hmm. So coming to Chicago, meeting Elsbeth and then creating this work, uh, it was like a kismet. As you said earlier, it was like an intuitive aspect of me that said, go to Chicago and meet Elsbeth. You know, <laughs> even though a company hired me, that was the ruse, you know, but it was really coming here to meet Elsbeth and do this work. So, you know, relationships never what it was. It's never what it's going to be. It's what it is. And most of us can't be with what it is because mm -hmm. we are in our head, analyzing the moment, thinking about the past, figuring out the future, and we miss the moment. Uh -huh. So in, in this work, we really practice familiarity and accessibility to the moment. That was beautiful. I loved how you just said that. Mm. So busy elsewhere that mm. we miss the right now and the present. That is very powerful. Um, and I want to hearken back to something, Freddie, you said in the very beginning, you left us with a teaser and mm. you use the words sexual or sex transmutation. And you said you wanted to talk about that later. Well, here we are. Okay. So I would like to hear about that. What is sex transmutation? Yeah. Okay, well, science will tell you that energy is one. There's no any kind of energy before you turn it into uh, electrical energy to drive a, a, a light a light bulb or drive a car or some other kind of way of energy. But it's unique when it manifests as sexual energy. It's creative and it's pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And when men don't have the ejaculatory reflex and lose that energy through the lust or through the Pro, you know, the, 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 the procreative process, you know, and we start to bring some consciousness to it, we can transmute that general energy to, again, I mentioned it earlier, to empower our creative day, to be more connected in the moment with our beloved, to uh, be, have energy to play with our kids, have energy to catch a plane or whatever it might be. That's transmuting yeah. sexual energy. So this is just as applicable to women, not just to men, that we can just as we harnessed electric energy, you know, 200 years ago, we can harness our sexual energy. The sexual energy is there already because it's life force energy. It's the same. Sexual energy and life force energy are not different. So it just shows up at different gradations, you know, that right now it's probably, you know, a subtle energy, at least I assume that none of us is aroused right now. So, um, and then it goes up, you know, all the way to 
highly aroused and then the climax. So it's there's this whole range and we want to become more attuned to this range and be sensitive and, and notice. And then I can learn to breathe up that orgasmic nectar or that subtle energy. I can breathe it up through my torso up into my third eye. And then instead of having a climax or an ejaculation, I can circulate it. So I can stay in this energy for a long time. I do not have to have a climax or an ejaculation to complete because after a while I, feel fe I will feel complete, very satisfying, very fulfilling. I can also transmute it into a project, into writing a book, you know, or in to creating a company. Yeah, Napoleon Hill spoke about it in reference to what he, his book was about, which was making money and being you know, financially successful. So you can do ritual and you have that as an intention to have your project, whatever your, your business uh, work be what you envision it to be. And what happens is you get really deeply connected to that vision, more deeply connected in that altered state of what happens in the sexual energetic as a ritual practice. And I know you sometimes people might listen and say, well, that sounds a little woo-woo, but you know what's really woo-woo, Debbie, are single-celled amoebas, multi-celled organisms, and a universe that goes on for ad infinitum. And that's our lineage. Mm -hmm. So we are just uncovering something that was around before we as homo sapiens thinking and aware of our own existence had language before we even had language this energy was around so we're just beginning to uncover what's possible and i think that the whole elspin mentioned it earlier the whole uh you know focus on pornography and a lot of the sexual abusive stuff that's happened in a lot of these organizations is all part of the the, the spiritual the quantum leap that we are about to make in terms of really getting this energy as a way of being and it's not about sodom and gomorrah it's about being what this energy is when we're in it. We could teach these practices to nuns and priests, and it would shift how they are being with their parishioners uh, and living in their I life. Mean, in a conscious way, yeah. not like the priests in the Catholic Church. Right, right, right. Totally get it. Yeah, that's so powerful. It, and it sounds like um, the circulating the sexual energy, um, it sounds delicious, to be honest. And I, I'm just as I'm listening to you, there are things that my partner and I do, just, you know, some we've heard a little bit and then instinctively um, do things like this breathing and the gazing, uh, not exactly as you do, but I can tell you makes a huge difference that everything else falls away and to look into someone's eyes, to have the, the appreciation, the beauty, the care, just the beingness in that moment. We did it last night before we went to bed. Hmm. And um, I can see your glow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And oh. then we have things we we don't we we actually haven't done it enough, you know. And there are things we do that I call the nest. Like, can we nest tonight? You know, so mm -hmm. we can create some of that intimacy and some of that receiving. And and it's um, it's really important to me. Yeah. Like, I, and I, I just want to also address as I'm saying that age, because, you know, I think it's easy for people to assume as you were giving out some ages, 20s, 30s, and maybe early 40s. But, you know, for people who are older than that, I remember I saw there was um, a great show and I won't remember the name of it. It was like on HBO or Showtime. Famous Irish actor was playing a therapist and people used to come see him. And the only thing I remember about this show is that there was an older couple, 70s or 80s, and you used to see them. There was literally lovemaking scenes of them in bed. And I was like, yes, like that is so beautiful that TV is depicting that. They're not sitting in some rocking chair. These are vital, alive, loving, involved, intimate people, couple. So let's talk a little bit about age, age and this Tantra. Yeah. Yes. Well, let me just start. I'll start out by saying, like I said earlier, it's not what it was, not what it's going to be. It's what it is. And when we drop our resistance to what it is, everything's good. Mm -hmm. So as we change as men from being really highly sexually active in our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s even, and we start to slow down, wind down, what is it risk wishing that it's going to be what it was? 
It's what it is. So how do we move with that? And what new skills do we learn and employ? So that's the thing. Yeah, and also for a man really tuning more, again, this connection of sex and heart. Mm, yes. Because he gets more attuned to the subtleties within himself and the listening and the appreciation of pleasure that is not dependent on performance. You know, so the other dimensions open up. And for me, I'm 72 years old, you know, and I'm young. Just... <laughs> oh, yeah. And hot and young and gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you know, to it's all about aliveness. So what uh, back to intentionality, bring the uh, intentionality to the energetic aliveness and through the tantric practice there is you know with the breathing and the energy and of course also what I put into my mouth you know and how I move my body all of that how I support myself hormonally all of that plays a role the dedication is to be uh, to be and feel alive and uh, so aliveness, we really activate through greater consciousness around our energetic self. You know, there are other ways, as I said, nutrition, hormones, all of that, appropriate exercise. Eating nothing good. Has, yeah, yeah, it's nothing all has to be overdone. It's just bringing awareness to that. And then the flow also through the tantric practice and aging is that we connect, you know, just like this, connecting heart to heart. Mm. It's like a heart orgasm. Mm. Heartgasms. I love it. Heartgasm. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, your Tantra Nova website, it's so cool because it also features theater, love tours, retreats, and more. Can you unpack a little bit about what's possible, Freddie? It looks like you're a song and dance man. <laughs> yeah, I do that too. It's been a um, passion of mine since I was a little kid, actually. I used to play guitar, and then I had this big growth spurt uh, towards the end of elementary school, and then athletics became my winning suit, and I went on to college on scholarship with that. But when we founded this work 21 years ago, I wanted to uh, rediscover myself in terms of theater, because there's such opportunity for insight in theater because you are totally unmasked and so on. So I created this show at one time in our work that I toured, toured all over the world and there were five songs in it, original songs. Uh, and I, so I did it the way I wanted to do those songs. Uh, but after the show and I stopped touring the show, I wanted to learn singing jazz. So I've been singing jazz for about three or four years now, and I sing at the jazz clubs. And actually, uh, April 9th, next Saturday, we're doing what we do a couple, three or four times a year. It's called a musical soiree here at our institute. And we have guests who pay, they come, and you can wear your, you wear your tuxedo. I'm wearing mine. And we have hors d'oeuvres and uh, champagne, and I sing um, jazz tunes, I have a piano accompaniment, and it's a All great time. All around love and intimacy. and Yes. <laughs> Oh, well, wow. okay, beautiful. So talented. Well, Elspeth and Freddie, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? So what I'm dreaming, continue dreaming, is to really spread this opportunity that we shared with you today to you know, as many people as possible for their sake, that they can see, oh, there's another way of creating fulfillment in my life with myself, with a beloved, if I want to be with a beloved. So that, that new possibilities arise for people in how they can feel love, intimacy, and be deeply connected with their life-giving sexual self. No matter whatever your age. Mm -hmm. yeah, and wherever you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the best place for people to find you is at tantranova.com? Yes. Yes. T-A-N-T-R-A-N-O-V-A.com, like supernova, <laughs> tantranova. And also, of course, our 
book, uh, Sexual Enlightenment, How to Create Lasting Fulfillment in Life, Love and Intimacy is now available in Audible and audio books. So you don't have to hold the book anymore. You can just listen to it while you ride in your car. Ride your Peloton or golf or whatever you do and yes. cook. Mm -hmm. And get sexually enlightened. That's right. That's, right. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you both so much for coming on the show today. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Amazing. TantraNova.com, folks. And I end today's show with this quote from Chagyam Trungpa. Tantra is the hot blood of spiritual practice. It smashes the taboo against unreasonable happiness, a thunderbolt path, swift, joyful, and fierce. There is no authentic Tantra without profound commitment, discipline, courage, and a sense of wild, foolhardy, fearless abandon. Mm. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream podcast with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment. I love reading them and I get back to all of you. And next week on the show featured is Joya Sosnowski, a sound and voice healer and quantum spirituality coach. Joya has been studying the Aramaic teachings of Yeshua for many years and has created a formula for awakening and ascension based on these teachings. Remember folks, don't just dare to dream, but be really yummy and delicious in your life and learn how to practice Tantra, perhaps with these folks, read their book, listen to their Audible, and maybe go to Chicago and learn how you can have a truly ecstatic life. Thanks for joining us today.